Um, okay. Nice to see everyone here, and it's such an amazing event. Um, I'm having a little struggle with the technology, so you'll have to bear with me, but I think it's going pretty well so far. Um, I was also very flattered to see that I was called a distinguished speaker, so that was very nice. I think it's something you, you get to when you get to a, a certain age. Um, so I am a home educator in based in London, England. My children are 30 and 24, and they never went to school. Um, and I'm just going to give a brief overview of the situation in England and Wales, and then I hope we'll be able to talk about um, anything that you that you need to, any questions or, or any um, comments that you might want to have. Leslie, are you still there? Because I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, you're back. Thank you. OK. So um, do you want me to repeat that? I believe the last I heard was that um, you're going to tell us a little bit about home education, and then you're hoping for questions. So anything okay. you said after that, please. OK, yes. Um, I titled this Home Education in England and Wales because the law is slightly different in Scotland. If people are particularly interested in the law in Scotland, they could go to a website of an organization called Schoolhouse, which is very good at protecting the home education in Scotland. Um, it's not very different, but it's significantly different. So when I talk about home education, I'm talking about England and Wales. The first thing to say is that the law relating to elective home education, which is a word we've chosen to put on the front of this term home education, that means people who choose to keep their children out of school, um, this is addressed as a problem that I'll come to later, is that the responsibility for a child's education rests with the parents. Education is compulsory, but school is not. Um, the law actually says it's article, sorry, section 7 of the Education Act 1996, the parent of every child of compulsory school age, that's 5 to 16 to 18, that's another change I can talk about more if you want, shall cause him to, to receive efficient full-time education suitable to his age, ability, and aptitude and to any special educational needs he may have, either by regular attendance at school or otherwise. And it's this phrase, or otherwise, that allows us to home educate. And many people have taken up that phrase, for example, Education Otherwise, which is the national organization, support organization for home educators. Um, now, such that um, also we, we refer to Article 2 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which also allows parents, says that every child should have the right to education, but parents have the right to ensure such education and teaching is in conformity with their own religious and philosophical convictions. So, this these two bits of law together have allowed home education in England um, and Wales since the 1944 Education Act when, when it was compulsory. In, ironically, the reason this um, law was, it was then um, put into practice, the statute, this or otherwise, had to do with the royal family. Because at that time, the royal family didn't go to school and were taught by tutors at home. So they couldn't make it a law where every child must go to school because then the royal family would have to go to school. So we thank them very much for that because it's meant that probably England and Wales are, have the best laws for home education possibly in the world, but certainly they're excellent laws. And because parents are in law, the prime, respons prime responsibility, have the prime responsibility for their children's education, it means that we have, we can choose, and with together with our children, enormous amount of. Uh, we have enormous amount of rights 
over our family life. Now, there were some qualifications to this that they, they must receive, cause him to affect full-time education and suitable to his age, attitude and ability. Now, these have all been defined very, very loosely. Suitable and efficient are not defined in the Education Act, but they have been defined by court cases. Um, efficient has been broadly described in case law as that which achieves what it sets out to achieve. Now, this allows for people to set a philosophy of education, so they say how they feel education is. It doesn't have to look like school, but it, it can be um, suit the needs of those parents and that family, and then that education will fulfill those philosophical uh, objectives. Suitable is one that primarily equips a child for the life within the community of which he's a member. So that means that, for example, if your child, um, now this is, this is a, a difficult case, for example, if you live in London and your child doesn't speak English because he's being brought up in a, in a family and a community where English is not the main language, that is still a suitable education because his community, is, is, of which he's a member, brings them up. It, it specifically says, rather than the way of life of the country as a whole, as long as it doesn't close down the child's options in later years to some other form of life if they wish to. Um, so that, that could be argued that not learning English would do that, but speaking, for example, another tongue as your first tongue and learning English as your second would be perfectly reasonable within that. Now, because of these incredibly, uh, well, I would say just laws, because I'm hoping to get the history of home education, modern home education, has been um, a similar parallel, actually, I think, to a time of in America, with one exception, who, which is this fabulous woman called Joy Baker, who educated her four children in the late 40s and early 50s at home. Alone, I don't know, it, it, she was, I think her first child was school age in 1944, so she spans the time when education became compulsory for a much um, wider age group. And she just decided that school did not suit her children and kept them out and fought a legal battle for something like 11 years. There might be somebody, I wonder if you may know more than me, um, uh, can remember better. Um, and had her children taken into care um, in the middle of the night twice, but only for one night, and she went and sat outside the police station, screamed until they, they gave her the children back. Um, and she, in the end, she was fined and fined and fined, and she fought it and fought it. Uh, and there are some wonderful films on YouTube of her, very... Um, very opinionated woman. I'm not sure I agree with, totally with her reasons for home educating, but I think she's absolutely fantastic, sort of English eccentric. Um, and uh, we have tried to find her children who would now be older and uh, without much luck. So she's a very big, sort of 40s and 50s is a big sort of step on the road to home education. But the real, mod, what I would call modern home education started about the same time as GWF, about 19. 75 with a man called Dick Kitto and, and about four or five families who all met in a farm um, in North London, somewhere not too far, and formed a group called Education Otherwise, taking the otherwise from the law. And these families really were amazing trailblazers. They set up the national organization, and at that time there were very few people. Nobody was even thinking about it. But almost like John Holt in America, you know, started publicizing, started a newsletter. You know, there's no internet. There's no, you know, much harder to travel around at that time. And supported each other. And their children are now in their mid-40s, you know, um, mid-30s to mid-40s, all grown and, you know, very doing sorts of interesting things. Um, and I would call them almost the first wave of home educators in, in uh, England and Wales. And um, that set the, the open the ground and set the scene for, for the second wave, of which I, maybe I'm one and my children, um, where there were, as 
the momentum was growing. There were more and more home educators, um, and and because of the um, because of education otherwise, which we used to wait for, that they had a bi-monthly newsletter which everyone would send letters to and wait for with bated breath to get in. We would meet together. And so a tradition of grassroots, family-led, um, home-ed um, meeting groups started. Some of them were socializing. Some of them were for things like um, drama groups or Spanish or whatever. But mostly, it was a, a big function of them was to, for the parents to support each other and think, oh my god, are we doing the right thing? And fortunately, being in London, it was a, is a great place to home educate from the point of view of the museums and the culture and all the stuff going on. But also, there's you know it's a, it's a greater um, amount of the population, so there were lots of groups. By the time that I came along in 1988, so that's already 10 years of, of EO, um, education otherwise, there were a number of local groups. And that's what you did. Well, what I did, I in fact wrote to EO and said, will I be taken to jail if I do this crazy thing? Because we were living in Canada at the time. And I, I don't know how I found out about it. Um, but I read Teach Your Own, and that was it. I thought, well, we'll have a go. And my um, the, the local contact, was EO had contact people that were volunteer all over the country for an area, a geographic area. And if people were interested there, they would ring their phone number and they would say, talk you through it and all the you know, doubts and so on that I'm sure many of you know about that sort of contact. Um, so through these local groups, um, people develop, it developed and people would be drawn, the bigger the groups, the what is going on, people would be drawn, you know, some would do sports, some would do, and so on. And so there's been a very strong element of autonomous education, which is a horrible word. I think in America they say unschoolers, but autonomous education here means more child-led, child-directed um, learning. And there really hasn't been, in the history of home ed in England well so much, the religious side of it has, hasn't been apparent at all. There are religious, I mean, people who are home educate for religious reasons, but they tend to keep to themselves. So that the main body of home educators is not centered around in any way um, religious parts. I mean, people people are religious, and that's their private belief systems, that's their homes and things. It doesn't come into the history of the movement. And one of the other things that education other, otherwise did was have um, three times a year they'd have trips which were very, very important for the people. So people, even if you didn't have many friends or your children didn't have many friends in your area, you could still know that there was a trip coming up. And they would usually be in youth hostels or in a very um, reasonably priced sort of hostel type places or camps. And this kept people out. It was enough friendship that people could, um, the children and adults could meet each other enough times. So. Um, unlike London, that most of the other home ed groups around were quite scattered, quite far and few between. Now, what this um, sec Section 7 of this 1996 Act means is that um, there are res some responsibilities for local authorities. That's what we call our, uh, our local government. Now, they have no duty or right to monitor home education at all because it's the parent's responsibility. They have no right to see the child. They have no right to see any work or any kind of output from the child. Um, they have no duty either to register if the child is home educating or not. Um, so they have no, they should have no record of how many home educators there are. And it is a very, very difficult thing to say. People often ask how many home educators are there in England and Wales, and we don't know. And there's speculation between from about 60,000 families, sorry, um, 6,000 families to about 50,000 families. And we, we really don't know. Um, local authorities 
should offer support and information for parents, they can make informal inquiries. If, if the child comes to their attention that they aren't in school, they can make informal inquiries as to how they're being educated and then their parents can say, oh, thank you very much, we're educating them at home. Um, they might ask for a philosophy of education and they say our education is to follow the child and um, we, therefore we have no output, no output, you know, that, that looks like school, we have no writing, no textbooks, no nothing on paper that we can show you and that's fine because that fits in with our education um, they, and that should be in law that's enough to satisfy them and they can they often do ask to see the children but they they should accept other methods of um, having their informal inquiries um, satisfied such as a letter um, or meeting the parents in a in a place a neutral place where they, they often have to come to the house and people don't like them coming into their house. Now, the only way they can prosecute parents is if they can have evidence, and it's put negatively in law, so it's difficult to understand, that there is no education present. So they need evidence of no education, which is very difficult to get. If, for example, a family are not really bothered and they are the child is being left and the authorities make um, an act, uh, ask to see some evidence of education and nothing happens and nothing happens and nothing happens, they can then issue a school attendance order which says that within two weeks if we don't see evidence the child must go to school. Um, and they are fairly, for selective home educators they are not that often um, issued. I've known of two cases, I think, in the sort of 25 years that I've been in home ed, where they were issued fairly, I think, um, where the family wasn't coping with home education. But mostly, they families write back and say, "Here's evidence of our education." Now, if they if you come out of school, um, the law has changed fairly recently in the last 10 years. And you don't, you, when, when you're at school, what you're essentially doing in law is you are giving the school loco parentis. So the school has now responsibility for the children's education. However, typically it is possible that if your child fails at school, you as a parent could be sued because in law you are responsible for the child's education. And if you choose to send your child to a bad school, that is you failing in your responsibility never been done and I hope it isn't done because the law is a very blunt instrument but it is in in law it is possible in England and Wales to do that. Um, so if your child's at school and you want to come out you have to deregister them which only means writing a letter saying my child I'm now making other arrangements for my child please deregister from your um, register and write and tell me you've done so and that's it. The school has no authority to allow you to home educate or to agree to it. It is the parent's choice to educate otherwise the end. Um, so it's very odd when I have no feedback from anyone. So I hope everybody's okay. <laughs> Not, um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm fulfilling the, I'm giving you the information you're hoping for. So, Sarah, uh, so, excuse me, I'm sorry, this is Renee. Tara just made a comment that except uh, in the case of children with special needs, so I think she um, made that comment just after uh, your last comment about the letter, uh, writing the letter declaring that you're going to be making other arrangements. And so Tara was suggesting um, in cases of with children with special needs, there might be a, a different consideration or, or something else to think about. I don't know if you see that um, comment yes, made there. Okay, I, yeah, I can't see any comments or anything, but that's fine, as long as you can let me know. Um, now, with children with special needs, it is slightly different, and you probably know the law better than I do, but I do know that if a child has a statement, which often children with special needs do have, that statement refers to the school and the authorities. This is not a statement for the child, sorry, for the family. So if, for example, uh, this child has speech problems, and it, the statement says, that the school must provide an extra teacher for, to help the child 
um, develop their speech. That does not mean if the child, if the family choose to home educate, that the family must provide a special teacher to help them home educate. That statement only relates to the school, and a lot of schools don't realize this. They say to people with children with special needs, you cannot home educate because you can't provide the st what the statement says. So that, that's one important point. But it is true that it, it's more likely that the authorities need to be convinced, sorry, not more likely, that the law supports more um, intervention by the authorities to be con to show that you can cope with the children with special needs. Um, be able to support them, not just cope with it, but be able to support them. Um, okay, so talking about, so this, it grew from this small group of about six families to a steady growth to when, when we, when my children were young, um, you know, I don't know, I'm going to guess 20,000 families in, in London, in, sorry, in, in England while we're home educating. I mean, it was growing steadily from the 60s, sorry, uh, mid 70s to mid 90s. Um, and there was, there's been more research done, not a lot, but there still has been research done. Um, Paula Rothermel, Alan Tom, Dr. Alan Thomas have written books in the, in the late 90s about home education, about informal learning, and how effective it is and, and uh, efficient. And then um, we had this huge crisis in 2009 when the Labour government, which was very uh, arrogant, uh, see, see where, where I lie, um, very strong, very certain that the government knew best and it was, it was change, changing uh, laws all over the place to make sure that the government uh, power was becoming more and more centralized, more and more Big Brother with cameras going up and, you know, especially with the terrorism issues. And this chap, um, Graham Badman, which is his real name, and we did call him other things, was charged with looking at home education in particularly in England, and making sure that the law was good enough and the children were developing around it. Uh, now, he came to the subject with um, a bias. He came from the school system. He, um, his background was all about schools. We opened up in the home education community, I would say, opened up and allowed him to come to some local groups and to see different uh, teams, took him around. I know in Birmingham they spent two days with him, I think, um, hoping that his report would say home education is thriving and it's wonderful. Um, unfortunately, the report came out in the autumn of 2009 saying that home education is twice as likely to have child abusers as um, any other population, and is a cover for forced marriages. Now, this has been a problem that people have brought up um, in England, where um, certain uh, Southeast Asian communities uh, would take their girls, children uh, away from about the age of 12, 13. They would, they would suddenly disappear over the summer holidays and go back to various countries and be married off. This is still a problem doesn't happen very much, but it is still a problem. Um, now, quite early on, the, there was a select committee, which is a sort of special committee at Parliament to look into home education due to the tremendous organizing by the home ed community and also the internet. Um, the internet actually was so fantastic, but really the way everyone came together was, you know, just filled with tears just thinking about it, although we, I think we're all still a bit burnt out and shocked from it as well, you know, whatever it is, three, four years later. Um, the, the way things, the way statistics were twisted, the way it was, uh, we were made to look, oh, well, you know, you're okay, but of course there's all these other families that we don't know about, which are, you know, child abusing, and you know, it's all, you know, it's just the, the devils were pouring out of people. Um, so. There were fortunately, it was a Labour government, and there, the, the opposition, the Conservatives and the Lib Dems, we managed to turn them around to our side. So, and, and we won really because of a lot of luck, although 
it, we wouldn't have won if we hadn't have done all the work we did because we managed to get uh, the conservatives basically on our side such that there's this terrible thing that happens when a government um, goes for, for an election. We were lucky that the election happened before this bill, this education bill, came, or, sorry, Education Act. Well, before it was passed, it's a bill. Okay, so the education bill had these two clauses in it. One which said that the authority, the local authority, has to, um, has a right to see everything that the child does and basically okays the home education. So you're not allowed to home educate, you wouldn't be if this had gone through. The, the local authority would monitor the home education and see if it was good enough. So it was taking the, the responsibility for children's education away from parents and giving it to the local authority, although it wasn't saying it was doing that. It wasn't going to change primary legislation. That still, that section seven would have stayed the same. It was just adding on top of that these two clauses. Now, fortunately, we had the conservatives on our side and they said there's this, there's this time when the government goes in, um, leaves power. It wants to get a lot of its laws enacted quickly. So they don't debate them, they call the wash up. They just um, make deals. And the, and the Conservatives said that they would vote for the education bill to be passed, but only if those two clauses were taken out, which they were. And we were saved um, because of that. So it was part fantastic organizing. And the part of the good organizing was, which I think the very good lessons of people fighting a legal battle, is that there was no center, there was no one organization that was representing home education in England and Wales. So they couldn't coerce or pick off or co-opt um, co a bunch of people to say, oh, you know, come on, just agree with this and, you know, we'll wine and dine you and, and get you on our side. Every time, it also meant that we, every time somebody was tired and exhausted, um, had written a huge amount of work, done a big work, but there was a, a right to reply, which is a huge document that one person did, they, they could then drop out of the fight and take some time off, and other people would pick up uh, the work that needed doing, because no one set of people was doing the work. And we, we did have several lists where we talk to each other and people would say, right, this needs doing. We need, we need to go and monitor and lobby this person. Or we had a, a mass lobby where loads of us turned out. We had a little demo outside Parliament and a ding went up. Is that okay? I'm sorry. I, if um, this is Renee, I didn't want to interrupt you. I, I bet yeah. I know Tara made a com comment about flexi schooling being subsequently stopped. And if you're not seeing this chat, you may notice in your chat box on the bottom there's a tab where you can see chats between just moderators. But if you click over on the tab that says room, you will see these comments as they're coming up. Oh, I clicked on the room and there's nothing. So you don't see Tara? Do, oh, I've got, got it. it. Okay. okay. I, I hate to interrupt. I'm okay. so sorry, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity no, 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 to no, no, interact no. with the participants and their comments. Absolutely, because I feel like I'm out in the, on the, in the forest here all my own. I don't know what's going on. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just reading. The conservatives have, have subsequently stopped flex schooling now. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I, I can talk to flex. Um, so we did manage to stop Badman, and since then there has been an all-party um, parliamentary committee that meets one day a year, specifically about home education, asking us about the issues that we're facing. So many of us before the Badman year. Um, felt that we just keep our heads down. And even though the local authorities didn't like it, we had the law on our side, we could fight them. Uh, many of us were never known. My children were never known to the local authority. They never went to school. They, that's it. They, I had, had nothing to do with the authorities whatsoever. Um, but after Badman, we've been found. Home education is now much more mainstream. It's in the sense that it's talked about in the press and Local authorities know about it, um, and there's been some consequences. 
from bad man that I, I think. One of which is that many local authorities think that the bad man um, clauses were passed and they are behaving as if uh, it's the truth that, that those laws passed. Because of the tremendous um, stirring about child abuse that there's been for all sorts of reasons, not just for home education, this whole idea that home education and child abuse go, go together has been put in the public and the local authorities' mind. And we are fighting a rear guard action to try and separate these. There have been some high profile cases of children, unfortunately, who were either killed by their parents or neglected, who were home educating. But in none of these cases was the home education in any way implicated. For example, all of the children were also well, well known to social services, to, to the authorities. For one was a foster child. The children were actually given to this family, and they were, they were visited constantly. So that the fact that they were home educating was neither here nor there. Another had only been home educating for 10 days. Um, and uh, well, we've also just had a, a, a terrible case uh, of, a, of a young uh, six-year-old boy who was killed by his mother and stepfather, um, who was going to school every day. So th there's an idea that must be challenged in the authority's mind that if you're at school, you're safe, and if you're at home, you are open to abuse. And, and this just is not true. Um, and we, the other thing, the other thing that happens with the, with, is that the authorities are, m m many of the authorities are stricter. They think they have a duty to monitor. So before we could just be, be quiet and just keep our heads down and nobody paid attention to us, I think because of the third consequence of bad man, which has been that the numbers of home educators are growing enormously. And this is, has a lot of reasons. Some of which is bad man and the fact that we became well, more well known and there's been lots of articles and you know, following a family and more research and so on. But a lot of it has to do with the failure of the school system. And as the school and also the, the government policies of loosening the school system so that there's a lot more private schools, there's these academies now where other, the state doesn't um, control all the state schools now. It pays for some of the schools, but it doesn't control them. So there's a lot more different ways of educating, a lot more different school types now. So this, uh, people are now educating, home educating, oh, oh, well, let's just do it, try it this year, and then, you know, maybe we'll try a private school next year, or maybe we'll go to Steiner school. So it's becoming more of a lifestyle choice, which in some ways, to me, actually threatens home education as much as bad man, because what's happening for me is the the old, I would say, one year or two year journey that the family had to go through, the struggle at the beginning to understand autonomous home education and how that works and how it works for them and are we doing the right thing, people aren't going through that anymore. So they're, they're swamping in massive numbers, the homemade groups coming along saying, oh, well, we've got tutors for this and that. And you know, they're not challenging what education is. They're still keeping in their minds that education equals a school method. They might, but they're doing it in a different way. They're doing it at home. Now, I've, I've, I've said this to a lot of people, and I've been challenged. Some people have said, but even if they are doing that, they are still doing much less schoolwork and having a much better, themselves having a much better time because it's, you know, it's not six, seven hours a day with 30 other kids than they would be if they're at school. So it's still better, and it's still um, better for family life and childhood. I don't know. I mean, for me, the fantastic thing about home education is autonomous education, is learning to be yourself, to learn yourself, no matter what age you are. So it's not about the children or and us teaching the children, it's about all of us going through life's journey together and learning whatever we learn from it um, at, at, at whatever stage that we're at. And I, I think I'll probably stop there and go over to questions. Thank you. Oh, that was so wonderful. Thank you. I now have a, a 
tons more knowledge and even about um, just what uh, your circumstances are over there. And so great opportunity to open it up for questions. If you have a question, I'm going to go ahead and enable the mics. You can raise your hand or you can type in uh, your question in the chat box and I'll read it out. Um, so uh, go ahead and just let us know or share your thoughts and your ideas for Leslie to respond to and dialogue with. Okay. Um, can I just Tara, Tara, are you from England? Yes. Okay, great. Um, nice to see you here. Isn't this weird? Um, where are you? What part of England are you? Sorry, just wait for her to respond. Cumbria. Okay, great. Up north. Um, yes. Absolutely. Not all home educators choose autonomous education at, at, in the least. But I think that it it still was, when I was in the mainstream of my home education, even if you were doing what we call school at home in England, which means more, you know, you sit, you might, people might sit down at 9 o'clock and do maths for an hour, you know, or they might do uh, maybe they might do something that looks very much like school with a timetable, but they might even be looser. They might just do maths one day and English the next day or whatever. Um, okay, great. Um, they still had a struggle. They still went through, is this the, West, the best way to do it? Are we doing the right thing? And I feel that that's missing more and more. As home education moves into the mainstream and becomes more acceptable, it's, in fact, I mean, one of the, the, the evidence of that is the fact that this horrible term, sorry everyone from America, is coming over here, homeschooling, as if that, and I, I feel very strongly that that is the wrong term, because that gives people the impression that we're doing school at home, and that is not what we're doing. Even if you'd have a timetable, you still might only have it for two or three hours. I mean, you can certainly get through probably more work than you would do at school in two or three hours at home when you've just got one to three or one to, you know, one, to one or you know, one to six even. You haven't got uh, 20 little people who've all got different needs and wants and ideas. And um, so that, it's that journey, it's that wonder being so outside the mainstream that you have to constantly question what you're doing and justify it and think about it that I found so politicized people so made them so thoughtful made them so um, they were really taking their life into their hands by um, by having to concretize and um, and be eloquent about it. You know, every time you went to the supermarket, people say, oh, no, no school today. And you, you would have to go on and, you know. And now they say, oh, homeschooler. You think, oh. So it's one of my pet peeves. Sorry, or I'll read what you say. Okay, what my worry is that what's happening is that home education, yes, it does challenge school, but that the ideology is becoming the same. So the ideology of home, it's just school in a different place. It's cheap school. And I've heard that actually in America now, you can choose to do school on the internet, for example. For me, it's the curriculum that's the most that to turn. It's not where you go. I mean, it is where you go to. Yes, you don't have to sit in a room with 20 other people who all have needs and wants and so on. It's equally as important as yours. But if somebody is telling you the curriculum, what you need to learn by what time in, in your life, that's the crux. If you're not driving the curriculum, um, for me, that you're not, what the beauty of home education isn't being realized. Okay. <laughs> Tara says she's not sure she agrees. But that's fine. Um, yeah, I think the if home education is to do school in a different way, for me that's not so interesting. 
the this autonomous method of being able to um, it, to a degree some people it's, it's their major the major way they do home education some people it's just a part of their home education that is what gives people I think the sense of self for me education is about self confidence and self knowledge it's not about curriculum because it's when you know who you are and what you want to do then you can go off and say right I want to be a hairdresser I want to be a physicist I want to be a carpenter and you can find out how to do it it's having the self knowledge and confidence to do that and one of the greatest things someone said to me when I first started was that they were home educating so that their child wouldn't have a breakdown when they were 40 years old and say I never I don't know who I am and I you know I don't know what I want to be and so on which so has so often happens to people who've been through a school system where they've been told what to learn when and they've also been really told what success is that's another it is in autonomous education you have to change your vision of success as well success is not exams or status or money or power it self knowledge and self responsibility yeah great absolutely i mean um Sara said that um a combination works best for her um you you know people change and people need different things at different times sometimes people need more, want more structure sometimes they want less um for me also parents are very much a part of a home education it's not just that we're not just sit there and say to the child whenever you need me I'm here you know what I'm just a doormat you know sometimes parents need autonomous parents they look I need you to read I just can't, I can't you know I'm sorry you'll have to uh take some lessons in or it will have to do some structure in, in this that or the other that's of course that's part of the compromises or the, the working out of life and also people change I think around 12ish young people tend to want more structure in their life they they want to narrow you know up to up to most of their childhood they um they um most of their childhood you know they're they're happy to go for this workshop or that workshop or whatever and do whatever mum or dad puts in front of them they say okay fine one day it's the Romans the next day it's finger painting or whatever but around 12 ish people start to say well hang on I don't really want to do that anymore you know I would like to do my daughter once said to me Spanish guitar filmmaking and physics something like that and I thought oh my god so <laughs> some that within my capabilities and with all the people I know and so on we have to figure out how she was going to do that because I thought well I'm here to support her in her learning and that was when she was around 12 and she you know started to sort of do more consistent more um you know practice type learning over time that developed starting from a low level and, and working up to a higher stage and I think that's typical of of, of the ages of people um doing that sort of you know they change into a different style of learning and want more structure and also it depends on the of course on the person uh, yes um Tara said that Right, so that, uh, leaving school, people might want more structure. In my experience, leaving often people leave school due to a problem, um, bullying or failure to thrive, or they're becoming bullies. Um, there's some something wrong, and this takes a long time to get over, and it's not to do with education it's to do with depression or anger or upsetness of you know emotional problems or emotional feelings that the person has which they've been sitting on for a long time so they may have been struggling trying to until you know parents don't hear about it necessarily or teachers until it's quite extreme and the child's gone through a lot um, and 
that can take, in my experience, anywhere from one to two years for people to work through. You know when people are little and they just, you just can't stop them learning. I mean, maybe, you know, you're washing up, they want to wash up. You're writing a letter, they, you know, whatever adults are doing, they want to be around, they want to be in it. That little bright, sparking person who's building with the bricks or, you know, flicking through the books or whatever, looking under the carpet, getting into little, not mischief, but because they're just exploring, tends to disappear in a depressed child, particularly one at school. And to get that back, that sort of center, that core, takes a long time. And I'm not sure it's structured. What I often say to people is, declare yourself on summer holiday. Pretend you're on summer holiday. So even if it's October or whatever. So what would you do on summer holiday? Well, you, you know, you hang around quite a bit, play with friends and picnics and, you know, make some cake. Then you go to museums and you might go away for a little while and, you know, that sort of thing so that people can find their feet again. His motivation was dwindling, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I think in a way being autonomous, that being autonomous doesn't mean leaving someone to their own devices and just saying, well, you know, I'm in the kitchen, call me when you're ready. It's actually very, very active. It's, you know, looking at, the, like you would with a friend, you know, what do you want to do today? You know, I, would you like to, you know, oh, there's this great thing on. Should we go? Oh, no, okay, right, well, then we will go. Oh, there's another thing on. Or should we meet a friend? You know, it's just living your life together. But it is being very active and very much listening to the people around you to see what they need, what they want to do. Trying to foster their sense of, self-identity and self-confidence by saying, I'm here for you, I'm here to support you, not literally saying it, but by, by acting it out. Um, it's a fantastic world out there. There's so many interesting things. So you model that as well in your own life. And I've always said, you know, things that we did, I had to be interested in. I'm there. I don't want to do something that, you know, I'm not that interested in. So we did. But, you know, it is a fantastic world out there. And there's loads to do and see. Let's go for it. Yeah. I, I often think it's, we are very successful. Sorry, I just read Alison's comment about um, perhaps parents prefer a structure. I think in our society, we're very success-oriented and very outcome-oriented. What have you achieved? What have you done? Let me see. This can also be very true for the other spouse who's not at home a lot. When they come home, they want to see something been done. What have you been doing all day? You've just been, you know, messing about. You haven't achieved anything. Um, and actually, if you can let that go, even gradually, and just spend some time being together and doing stuff that not, doesn't have an outcome that you can see, uh, it's often the home educating parent that can see the development changes, even when there's no outcome or success or obvious success or something to show. And that's a, that's a lesson for us parents to learn. Right. So, the, yeah. Often the parent who's doing the mainstream home educating can see the development in very subtle, tiny ways in the young person. Whereas the parent who doesn't, who, you know, who's at work all day or comes home tired and can't, doesn't have the space to be open enough to say, okay, how are you today? Where are you? So it's really important that that person spend as much time as possible of the free time together with, so they can, they don't feel left out. And it is also very, you know, spending a lot of time with people and going out and doing stuff on the Romans or making a pot or, you know, going to see the police dogs. It's a very enriching and exciting life, and I think often the person who's not involved in that can feel left out and actually quite jealous, even though they may not want to admit it. <laughs> because you're having a great time! And um, and they're maybe stuck at work. Um, so it is important to remember that and bring them in. And um, Yes, juggling home ed and work is not easy. I mean, I always said... As, as an autonomous, I'm a single, 
thing with my, my, my when my kids were little, I was as well. What I did, what I, I never really taught my kids anything. I was an organizer. So you are constantly organizing, right? That she wants a Spanish guitar, he's got uh, swimming, and then he's going over to a friend, and I've got to do, I've got to fit in my, I did um, a PhD during the sort of, it took me nine years part time over the time when my kids were little. Um, and it takes a bit of discipline <laughs> when you get your afternoon off because they're with grandma or whatever. Um, and I did have two grandmas, so I was very lucky about that. And also being in London, there's lots of families. You know, we would swap as well. They, they would have friends over. When they had friends over as well, I would hardly see them except, you know, every two hours for food or whatever. So that was that a time when I could work too. But it is juggling, constant juggling. And then somebody's ill and you, all your arrangements are messed up, so you have to re-juggle again. Um, yeah, but it's... It's a great life. I mean, you know, you're you're choosing. You're also choosing less money because probably you would be earning more if you weren't from educating. But you're living your life. You're being with your children. I don't know what people have children for, and they send them away for so much of the time. It's just if they aren't, you know, a thing that you have and then you can put around, they're a whole new life and experience that you're lucky to be a part of. Oh, well done, Tara. Working in home educating and PhD. Fantastic. Um, I actually, my PhD was about how parents, long term home educating parents, find it. You know, how was it for them? And my conclusions were, very briefly, um, that people, long term home educating parents, well, partly, part one of the conclusions was how amazing people are at finding work that fits in with home education. Sometimes people had new careers through home education. For example, one family, um, the mum wrote children's books, and then they um, they did um, what do you call it? Country dancing. So they they hired themselves out as a family, and they would. Um, they would go and run parties where they called dances and the, 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 um, the father and, the, and one of the children was in a band, so they would be a little band to, to, to do dancing. Um, another family, the children, they sold um, blinds or some sort of window something at, and they would travel all over America. Um, the children would sell at these conventions with the family, as much as the family. They, they were experts on these window things. Another family built boats, and the children were learning to, to build the boats with the family, with the dad. So, you know, people had work either where the children could get involved, or was it, sometimes it was part time. One family, the mum worked Monday to Wednesday, and dad worked Thursday to Saturday. So they would job juggle, or they would both work part time. I picked the, the, I was absolutely humbled by the thought and the creativity that had gone into all the different ways that people would figure out how they could juggle home education and work. It was quite extraordinary. And I, I think the internet has helped a lot too. I mean, say with some people in, in online publishing or um, other people proofreading, somebody else um, sells clothes from home so she could do that in the evenings after her partner came home. All sorts of arrangements that people had. Ex school children, ex school home ed children and parents' perceptions and experience at school. Ah, right. So, um, your PhDs about children who've been withdrawn from school, how the families find home educating. And I wonder if you have you put a time on it? Have they been home educating for a certain number of years or have they just started? Um, really interesting. So this is one of the things I uh, you the, there are quite a few people now doing research on home education, which is really interesting and has really in the last oh five eight years or maybe since Badman Two really come on um, a lot. Of, there's um, a, a journal called Other Education that's been started. Helen Lee's at uh, she in Birmingham. Do you know that? I'm sure you know that. Um, 
withdrawn the last five years. Right. Interest in the experiences of school published research about her. She met Hannah, right. She, I would, well, have a look at other education if you don't know. It's not just about um, home education, it's about other types of education as well. Um, Tara, I should, maybe I could give you my email if I can figure this out. <laughs> we can email sometime. Can I write in here? In the transition into home education. Um, Yes, Leslie, this is Renee again. You should be able to type right in the chat button um, and put your email address in there if you'd like to uh, make oh, that okay. available. That will be available to anyone watching the recording um, who sees that, um, so you're aware. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Alison, is that, is that, it's not Alison Ray, is it? Oh, hi! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> great, great to see you here. Isn't this amazing piece of machinery? Um, Renee, sorry, will I be able to see that chat room? Do I have to write this down before they go off the screen, or? Yeah, you should probably um, write that down, um, although, like I said, okay. you should be able to, from what I recall, when you, when you go back and watch the recordings, I believe the chats are in recordings as well, but I would take this information down now just in case okay. I'm wrong. Okay. Tara, you're at UWS, University of and just for those other participants that are listening, it's about 2.57, so we'll be wrapping up in just a few minutes. Um, so if you want to take down these uh, email addresses as well or have another uh, moment to just uh, share some ideas and collaborate with Leslie and, uh, or ask her any questions, it would be a good time to do that now in the chat box or using your microphone. Alison, are you doing a PhD? <laughs> yeah, that's the, everybody's sort of doing a PhD, yeah, quite. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> well, keep at it. Um, Cambridge and they want me to do Oh, okay. Right, yeah, you've got to jump through the hoops. Oh, me too. Thank you, Tara. I really enjoyed um, talking with you as well. And if you want any help, um, yes. Okay. Uh, also, I suppose I could put my, um, if you're interested in my PhD now, I'm showing off now, it's at the Otherwise Club. Uh, because you're academics, it might be useful. It's, it's on the Otherwise Club's website, which I'm putting up now, so you can see it there. I, I think, Alison, you, you know about it. Um, it's, it's up there in a PDF, but I would only read the introduction and the conclusion because it's really, really boring, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> um, did you publish anything, Alison, from the from the MA at the um, institute? Um. Oh, great! Yes, I think I've got that one. Yes. Thank you, Tara and Alison and Renee. Thank you so much for listening, and um, it's been really great. It's been a bit odd, but I'm really glad the technology worked, and I, I managed to make it well, my end, whatever I needed to do. <laughs>